Pace Morby. Bro, good to see you. Thanks for coming back on the channel. I think you are my favorite guest to have on the channel. People love you. This is my favorite channel of all time. I, this is where, where do you think I learned wholesaling? Where do you learn, <laughs> think I learned flipping? Where do you think I learned raising money? This is the greatest channel ever. Man, thank you for taking time. Guys, we're gonna do something really special. We're gonna create an entire series on creative financing. And I think we're gonna make probably, I don't know, 10, 12 videos in this series. I think when we put this all together as a playlist, it's gonna be everything and anything you could ever wanna know about creative financing. And there's no better time than right now for you to know this, not just now, but for the next probably 48 months, these strategies will dominate. They will change your life if you're a real estate agent, if you're a flipper, if you're a wholesaler, these things will double, triple, or quadruple your income just by knowing these strategies. And so Jerry had a great idea of doing a playlist starting from A, going all the way through Z, and whatever question you guys have in the comments, please make a comment down below. Of like, I don't understand this. I need more information on this because the next time Jerry and I hang out, we're gonna do another set of videos based on your questions. Love that. And Pace, you're so right. You know, creative is always a good strategy no matter what's going on. But you just mentioned right now, as of this recording for the next couple of years, mm -hmm. because we're gonna be seeing high interest rates and interest rates are gonna greatly affect people's ability to, to, to get capital for deals which means if you can take over existing financing, if you can leverage that already into deals, it's gonna be game changer. I mean, it's really gonna make a big difference. So that's why this is so relevant right now. I told somebody an analogy the other day. I said, if you go to play golf against Tiger Woods, he's gonna beat you no matter what, right? We got that. But showing up um, in a real estate transaction is like showing up to play Tiger Woods and you only have a putter, right? Like you need all the clubs in your bag in order to compete with anybody. And so these strategies, it's not that we're teaching you a completely different game, it's that we're adding new tools to an existing game, right? So people go, man, I wanna focus on wholesaling, I wanna focus on this. Guys, creative finance will amplify your game, it will give you all the clubs you need in your bag to go play a complete round of golf, essentially, in real estate, and give you a fighting chance. We've got, we both buy a lot of deals where other people couldn't make them work. Wholesalers go, hey, Jerry, I got a deal I don't know what to do with. It has no equity. Okay, well, I look at that deal and I go, I want it. Jerry looks at that deal and goes, I want it. You just got to know how to utilize those clubs in the bag. So this series is going to show you all of those clubs and in the proper order. And let's start from there because I think uh, most of the people that watch the channel, Pace, as you know, are wholesalers, a lot of people working on their first deal. And one of the basic things we learn is make an all-cash offer. And so when you make an all-cash offer, that cash that's going to come in and take down that deal, whether it's your cash or a cash buyer's cash, new capital for a deal, there is a cost to that money. And that cost of that money is very expensive because that money could be doing something else for somebody. So to bring new capital into a deal means you need the biggest discount on the property. How is that different? First, first of all, kind of big picture, how is that different when you leverage any of these creative financing strategies. So what's great about creative finance is that people go, man, you're, you're such a wizard, you're so amazing, you're this, that, and the other. Guys, I can tell you one thing before we jump into this and answer that question. Out of everybody I know that talks about creative finance as a, as a main strategy of theirs, Jerry, you know more about creative finance than guys that have been teaching creative finance for 30, 40 years, right? Like you do very creative strategies, so I'm so excited about this, yeah. this whole entire series. Very, very pumped. Hope you guys are excited too. So. With, um, with capital, if I go into an appointment, okay, when I was just doing wholesale like seven, eight years ago, I would go into an appointment knowing house is worth $200,000 after it's all the way fixed up. That means I gotta pay 110 to 130, depending on the condition yeah. of the property. So I gotta, I gotta get the seller all the way down there. And based on the convenience maybe I give them or the speed or them avoiding going through a real estate agent, that is worth it to that seller. But more often than not, I was running into sellers saying, dude, are you kidding me? You're gonna give me 50 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar of what my house could be worth? No, thank you. I'm just gonna fix it up myself. In fact, I think it's maybe like 5% actually fall into that camp where yes. they're willing to take that huge discount and that cash is just, well, they'll trade all that equity for the convenience of cash. Right, and this is where people come to me and they go, I think wholesale is where I should start. I go, well, first off, you can wholesale creative finance deals and we'll get to that. But second off, I think creative finance is actually way easier than wholesale. And the number one reason why is because we can pay way more money without actually coming out of pocket or without even borrowing money from a hard money lender or a private money lender. And the reason being is because the seller already has the debt secured 
and financed and approved in their name. So in order for me to deep, like deep dive them down to 50 cents on the dollar, I got to undercut everything they owe on that mortgage. Guys, just it's, I can pay 80 cents, 90 cents, sometimes a hundred cents on the dollar, win that appointment. Whereas when you're a wholesaler, all you're doing is going in and going, I got to lowball this person 50, 60 cents. Which one do you think is easier? Lowballing 50, 60 cents on the dollar or coming up to where the seller either owes or giving the seller the number they need as long as they give you creative finance terms, which we'll talk about in a minute. I've heard you say it does not make sense to take out existing debt with new debt, meaning bring in new capital to take out already existing capital that's in place on that property. One of my most viral um, YouTube shorts was a seller call I had. And I had a seller go, wait, so you're not gonna pay off my loan? And I go, nope, I'm not gonna pay off your loan. And she says, why wouldn't you pay off my loan? And I said, why would I pay off your loan? <laughs> because I have to go get a loan over here, a fresh brand new loan that just started over to pay off this loan that you've already had in place the only people that make any money in that transaction are two different banks and a bunch of loan officers and escrow officers make all the money. You don't make the money and I don't make the money. So why don't we just work out a deal directly where I can take over the existing debt and make you win and me win. Yeah. Last thing about creative finance is that, again, I think it's the only strategy that is a strategy where both parties completely win. In wholesale, I'm a wholesaler too, so I'm not knocking wholesale. I'm just saying creative finance gives you additional tools. The seller wins by getting a higher price. In wholesale, the seller wins by getting convenience. And so there is a place for both of those, but I find that there's more opportunities in my world because I have a different set of glasses that I'm wearing. I see more creative finance opportunities than I do see wholesale. And keep in mind, we're gonna be covering this quite a bit, but keep in mind, it's not so much wholesaling, it's not so much the cash offer when it comes to wholesaling because you can also wholesale these creative finance deals. In fact, when you, when you structure a creative finance deal with a seller, and let's say that you don't wanna keep that deal, it's not, it's not the right time for you, you wanna wholesale it, and that's awesome, make some cash, wholesale it. When you take that creative finance deal to a, another investor who does see a use, maybe they wanna hold it mm -hmm. and rent it or whatever they wanna do with it, they will pay a premium for that deal because you've created an opportunity where they don't have to come up with a lot of cash to get into the deal. The biggest assignment fee I've ever paid in my life was on a creative finance deal. It was a $210,000 assignment fee I paid as the buyer and I gave that to a wholesaler who'd never done a creative finance deal in his life. And he's like, are you kidding me? The biggest wholesale check I ever got was 15 grand. You just paid me $210,000. Here's the deal. The deal was a seller, 30 units in Texas, apartment complex, Seller was ready to retire, his name's Mario. And Mario says, I want my number. I don't care what you guys offer me, I want my number, I've owned this property for 20 years, I'm not budging at all. So the um, wholesaler goes, he's motivated, he wants to sell, he wants to retire, he doesn't wanna have tenants anymore, but I don't know what to do, this guy, I gotta offer him $1.7 million in order to wholesale this. Yeah. And I go, let me talk to the seller, and if I can get the seller to sell that $3 million to me and let me make payments to him with no money down, then I'll buy it for 3 million, which is his asking price. And I'll pay you, um, what I told him, I said, I'll pay you a percentage. I'll take the, my cash flow and I'll multiply it by 10 and that'll be your assignment fee. My cash flow on that property is $21,000 a month. And so I go, I, I offered him 10 times my, my cash flow. I'll pay you in an assignment fee up front. And so I, we worked out the deal. The seller gave me $3 million, no money down, 4% interest, and 50 years to pay the payment. Yeah. 50 years with no balloon payment. And some of you guys don't know what a balloon is, but we're gonna go into a lot of this stuff in the series coming up. So there's been some terminology, some little examples we've gone through really quickly, but this series is gonna be fun because we'll take a little bit more time, give these strategies a little bit more breath. Where do I find them? Where are they coming from? How do I handle the paperwork? Where do I go to get help? Those types of things. Um, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, so to end this video, maybe let's just list off seven or eight of the yeah. main strategies that we're gonna cover in this series. We'll then deep dive, so watch, watch for these next videos to come out because we're gonna really go into each one and full circle it. We're gonna talk about ways to acquire the, that type of a strategy, when it fits, how to structure it, how to know what to pay for it, what your, what your dispo strategies could be, all of it, Love but it. first, the, the very next video, we're gonna actually go into these instruments, some of this terminology, because 
you cannot really do well with creative financing if you don't understand how the instruments work. You got to have the vocabulary. You really need to understand how to structure before you can really do creative financing well. Yeah, and the thing I think people like about um, the way I teach creative finance is that I'm not that smart. And so when I listen to other people teach creative finance, I'm like, you guys make my brain just want to quit. Overcomplicated. Overcomplicated. They use terminology and words that don't make sense to the normal human being. So what we'll do is I'll talk about creative finance in everyday life that pertains to every strategy. So like the way my mom used to build her sewing business, she actually did it through creative finance. And I'll tie that in, tell you guys really good stories so you can understand at a very high level what these things are without having to like get your brains melted. Which is so important because if you can't explain it to your seller and you confuse the seller, you just killed your deal. Killed your deal. And sellers, uh, again, guys, when we're talking about creative finance, seller finance, sub two, blah, 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 wraps, notes, deeds of trust, da, 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 da. None of these things I actually ever say to the sellers, and neither does Jerry. I watch a lot of his seller calls. We tell stories, and we get people to understand everyday situations. So we're going to have a lot of fun with this. So let's say that I'm a wholesaler, right? Because a lot of people on your channel are wholesalers. I'm generating leads. I'm either cold calling, I'm texting, I'm sending out postcards, whatever it is. Leads are coming in. Here's what I found, okay? I found the average wholesaler has to look at about 40 to 50 leads in order to get one wholesale deal. Is that kind of the average yeah, you're looking at? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, yeah. so our acquisition team is 40 to 50 to get one cash deal. But I can take that exact same set of leads and utilizing this list we're gonna rattle off right now, I can get another four deals out of those same 50 leads. So think about that pace. People are spending thousands of dollars in marketing looking for that low cash offer scenario, that 5% motivated seller willing to take that big discount. What you're saying is out of that throw away, that money you've spent that now you're basically throwing away, you've got four more deals in that same list that is getting discarded by most wholesalers. Yeah. Um, Isn't that incredible? This may be an, al an analogy Jerry doesn't want me to put on his YouTube channel, but let's say you show up to a party and there's a bunch of guys and a bunch of girls. <laughs> and there's like 5% of the girls in there are really beautiful. They dress well, they did their hair, they wore their makeup, and they're there to, to look for a date. I don't necessarily want to always go after that 5% because guess where all the other men are? Everybody else is competing <laughs> for the same 5%. So for me, as I look around the room and I go, oh, hey, that deal over there or that real estate transaction or maybe that girl in my world, all she does, she's missing a dress. I'm gonna give her a nice dress. Oh my gosh, that's the most beautiful world <laughs> woman in the world. So you just gotta look at things and realize that the value is not on the surface a lot of times. The value could be in the individual deal. And we're gonna talk about how to undercover, uh, uncover that value and how to make money on that value so that you walk into a room, everybody else is competing on the 5% wholesale deals. I don't have to compete. I just have to be creative in, in my thinking. And I think I think the biggest mindset shift that has to happen with creative financing is to stop looking at price. Right. You know, as, as cash, when we do cash buyers and wholesalers that are thinking cash only type of transactions, it's all about the price. Whereas one of the things you teach is with creative, it's not about the price, it's about the use. Right, I tell people- The future value of that use. Right, so people go, well, how can you do that? How can you pay at that price? And I go, because the value of a, of a house in cash transactions is what you could sell it for to a family. But in creative finance, the value of the transaction is what you can do with it, right? The value of the use, like Jerry just said. So I don't look at the purchase price. In fact, when I underwrite a creative finance deal, the purchase price is like the fifth thing I look at. Yeah. The first thing I look at is what can it produce me in income versus what will it cost me on a monthly basis? And I figure out my spread and then I figure out number two, how much is this going to require for me to bring maybe a partner to the table or whatever? We can talk about that later. We could do a whole video on how to underwrite a creative finance deal totally. and the process we go through. Yeah, but I think guys, the, the whole point here with why we're doing this series is when you spend money on marketing or when you get on the phone with an agent or a seller, you wanna have all the tools in your toolbox to take advantage of each and every lead. Pace's goal and my goal is on every appointment walk out of there with a deal. And the more you understand creative, the more you can structure these amazing deals. And if you don't want them, wholesale them, but you've got to be able to become a full, full service acquisition engineer to really do this business well, especially with how much it's costing now 
to do marketing and to get in front of sellers, right? There's, right. We, when I jumped into the business, probably very similar to Jerry, is that when you were doing only cash transactions, you realize the most important KPI that I followed, key performance indicator, like the, the, the measurement of success in my business, um, was cost per contract, okay? So I would go spend money on marketing, let's say $10,000 in postcards for three months, and if I got one contract in three months, that means that one contract cost me $10,000. Mm -hmm. So my cost per contract was very, very high in that scenario. So I got really good at acquisitions and running the business. I was watching Flipping Mastery, just <laughs> FYI. Make sure you guys subscribe. So I was, I was learning those things and learning how to be really good at cash. But then I was like, man, how do I get my cost per contract down? Well, the answer is take those exact same leads and figure out how to get creative with those and my cost per contract would go from $10,000 a contract down to $1,500 a contract because I could have five contracts per set of leads rather than just one. So that's what we're going to be showing you guys today. And, and let's start with the list. What are the other strategies I can use besides just offering yeah, cash? Let's talk about that seven or eight main. There's lots. I think you, I've, I've saw you list off like one time 27 or yeah, whatever. Yeah, there's 27 different strategies but, in creative but Let's finance, stick yeah. to the maybe the top seven that people can that we're going to cover in this series and, and subsequent videos and really deep dive those seven or eight top ones. So, okay, in, so on I your would mind, say what are the top one, ones? Number one's got to be seller finance. Okay, it's commonly known. It's actually written in all the real estate contracts. It's legally written in so many, like every, every state has a seller carryback addendum for real estate agents. So even real estate agents know. You can find seller finance deals on landwatch.com. There's 11,700 listings right now on landwatch.com for seller finance, very common. Some of the other names are owner carry, yep. owner financing, seller financing, any um, others? There's another one that was really good, I forgot. Uh, seller carry back. Um, Keller carry back, yeah. Seller carry back, um, installment sale, okay? A lot of times sale. they'll call them installment sales. That's kind of an older school methodology. Uh, seller finance, um, um, creative finance, whatever. Or owner finance, they'll owner. Use owner finance, seller finance, those are synonymous of each other. But, but big picture, seller is the bank. Right, seller is the bank. So here is the reason you'll run into a lead, right? A lead comes into my system, whether I'm cold calling, texting, whatever. Typically, seller finance is the seller is looking for too high of a price. Okay, I call this um, gain. They are looking for gain. They don't care about anything else. They don't typically have pain. So these are the sellers you're on the phone with that are like, nope, I'm not budging on my price. Yes, I'm selling. I need to go downgrade, upgrade. I'm moving out of state, whatever. But no, I'm not budging on price. So the number one thing they care about is price. And so in seller finance, we can, we can pay the seller's price as long as they'll allow us to make payments on that price rather than go and get cash to give it all to them at the same time. Yeah. So seller finance, I'd say, is number one, most common. We'll start with that in video and number big one. big thing to remember is they have no debt on the property. No debt on the property. So they own it free and clear, which, by the way, I didn't realize this, but 30% of all real estate owned is free and clear. It's bonkers. When you drive around your town and you realize that one, or, yeah, one out of every three and a half houses that you drive by, or three, three out, out of ten, ten, you're like, these free are and clear. paid off? Yeah, free and clear. Paid off? Like that's how amazing the opportunity with seller finance is. So that's number one. We'll do that. That'll be the next video. No, yep. that'll be video number three. Yep. Because video number We're two. We're going to do instruments and terminology, some paperwork, of that. Paperwork, all yep. that stuff. Um, number two, what happens when a seller owes too much money on the property and they can't sell the property because there's no equity? Yep. That would be subject to. And we're going to see more and more of that coming up. It's overwhelming. Um, for me, this is how common creative finance is. I've turned off all cash acquisitions for the next 24 months. People DM me, they text me, they email, and they, they go, Pace, here's a great cash deal. I go, I'm not looking at cash. I'm so overwhelmed right now yeah. with sub two opportunities. Because the opportunities are so so big. It's overwhelming. Yeah. And here, let's. I'll give you a typical person. Somebody that, that's in foreclosure, right? They have lack of equity or the property needs a little bit of work and they don't want to go through a real estate agent or it didn't sell on the market or whatever. And this is crazy because here's what's happening. In Maricopa County, where you used to live, I live now, we had 3,000 listings on the MLS in January. We now have 23,000 listings less than 10 months later. So your, Huge inventory spike. Right, inventory spike. Days on market have gone way, way high. Real estate agents can't sell houses. It's, it's crazy. What about the people that got loans last year 
that want to sell. 3%, 4%, whatever in the last couple of years that now we're trying to sell and the market's already dipped 10%. It's going to dip another 10, 15% over the next 24 months. There's millions of opportunities that you guys can do so many things with that just a cash offer will never suffice. So Because they're upside down. They, upside they down. owe more than the market will pay. Right, or really close to what the market will pay, and it just doesn't justify the time or energy for them to get a real estate agent involved. Yeah, and some of them are listed. Some of them are listed, they're sitting because they're trying to sell it for 80,000 because they need to pay commissions and closing fees and pay off the mortgage, and it's sitting because the market wants to pay 70,000. Right, and so it doesn't sell. I, I mean, this is a whole video by itself, is that people misconstrue the word equity and spread. So if I owe two, if I have a house that's worth two hundred thousand dollars, but I owe one ninety, and I ask you how much equity does that person have, right? They owe one ninety to the bank. House is worth two hundred. How much equity do they have? People go, oh, it's ten thousand. No, it's not. <laughs> Incorrect. <laughs> equity is the amount of money you have in your pocket after you've sold your house and everybody's been paid. So in that situation, that person has about a negative ten thousand dollar equity, yeah. but it'll cost them about twenty grand to sell that house. I call it phantom equity because it's like fake equity. It's not real equity; it's paper equity. Right. But when you actually do the transaction, there are all the fees involved, and sellers just aren't educated on that. When you, when you acquire your property, you're not told, "Hey, just so you know, when you go to sell this house in five years or seven years, which is the average amount of time people stay in a house, you're going to have to pay about ten percent of the sales price." to commissions, closing costs, inspections, home warranties, escrow, title insurance, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And sometimes your buyers will ask you, the seller, to pay down their interest rate on their loan. So Pace, when, when the seller has an existing loan on the property, we call that sub two or subject two, meaning subject to existing financing. Right. That's the creative financing strategy, sub two, subject two. Right. That's, number, that's the second one on your list. What's the third one? Third one is hybrid. So hybrid. What happens when you have a seller who houses worth 200, they owe 100 on the property to let's say Chase, right? They have a bank, a bank loan with Chase. That means they have a $100,000 spread that you as a newbie, somebody new in the business goes, how do I pay that $100,000 and then take over their existing payment? Well, we, you don't. We actually create an agreement between you and the seller. So it's half sub two, half seller finance, the first position note, and we'll talk about this in the next videos, yeah. first position, second position. First position is a sub two, with second Chase. position yep. with Chase, and the second position is directly with the seller and whatever agreement you work out with them. This could be a variety of 25 different ways, but one could be I make small payments to them. Most of the time when I do a hybrid, hybrid, I tell the seller, I'll take over your existing payments with Chase, and I'm not gonna make any payments on your $100,000 for five years. But once five years is up, I'll either have refinanced the house, sold the house, or I'll start making payments. Yep. So a hybrid between seller financing and subject to combining the two. That's the third one. Mm -hmm. Fourth one? Fourth one, lease options. Lease options. Lease options have been around for a very, very long time. I did lease, op lease options heavy for about three years. There are some downfalls to lease options, while there are also some major upsides. And we'll talk about that in the lease options video coming up. Um, but lease option is where I go to the seller and I literally create a two document contract with them. One is a lease where I'm the tenant and the other document is an option that says, I have the option to buy this property at a very specific purchase price at a very specific date in the future or sooner that I can lock in today. So the value for me is I go to the seller and I go, hey, I'd like to buy your house on seller finance or sub two. Sometimes sellers go, no, I don't know that I trust you entirely, right? I don't run into this off, uh, opportunity. Here's why I did a lot of lease options. I wasn't great at negotiating when I first started. Mm -hmm. And so lease options were really great for somebody that was brand new that was not real. I didn't have flipping mastery when I started, okay? I couldn't watch negotiation videos and watch actual seller calls. So I would jump into lease options as kind of a crutch that I go to the seller and go, well, if you don't trust me to take over your mortgage or you don't trust me to do a seller finance, why don't I do a lease with you, show you that I'm worthy of this relationship, and then give me the option to buy it from you at a very fixed price in the future? Yeah, and there are some downsides. We'll cover that when we get to the lease right. option. But one of the great things is it obligates the seller who, who now cannot sell that property. So you buy some time. Right. It helps you buy some time because now you have the option to buy, but the seller cannot sell to right. somebody else. The cool thing about lease options too that people don't realize is I can do, I can wholesale a lease yes. option 
I can do a sandwich lease option mm -hmm. where I acquire a lease option and then I can do a lease option to the next person. So I'm technically in the deal, no money out of pocket. Every one of these strategies we're going to talk about, you can be into them, no money out of pocket. You can also do a master lease or you call arbitrage. We'll talk about yeah. that. That's one of your seven, isn't it? Or seven, right, right. Or eight. Okay. You could also do that from a lease option. It's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Lease options are, uh, there's very people, flexible. There's people like John Jackson. Are you friends with John Jackson? John Jackson teaches, that's all he teaches, lease options. It's that big of an opportunity, is that one strategy. There's people that literally teach nothing but lease options because of how diverse and powerful it is. Okay, so lease option, was that four? That's I think four. that was four. Okay, next one? Uh, next one would be, um, let's do arbitrage. So master okay. lease, right? So what I like about arbitrage is you get tenants, or I'm sorry, not tenants, but you get landlords that have listed properties for rent. You can go to them and instead of convincing them to sell the property to you, you just go, hey, I'll pay you your rent as long as you let me turn into an Airbnb. Uh, so I have a, I have an arbitrage deal that's a sober living. That thing makes me like $2,000 a month. And I did it off of one call. I had a student that goes, hey, um, I don't see you do a lot of arbitrage. Are they that easy? I go, bro, let's do it right now. Literally called off a Craigslist rental ad, called the guy, I go, hey, will you let me just lease this out? He goes, no problem, as long as you, this is what I told him. I go, I'm gonna turn into a sober living facility. He goes, okay, well, my rent is 1,200. If you pay me 1,500, I don't care what you do with the property. Yeah. So it's the ability to sublease. Sublease. So you have a master lease with the seller, and in that contract, it says you have the ability to then release it for other uses that that seller's not willing to do, like Airbnb or what you said, a sober lease. So it gives you that flexibility to then to make more money than the lease you're paying directly to the seller. Right, and so <clears throat> the, on that sober living facility, for example, I gave the seller in the master lease or the arbitrage situation, I gave him, he had $1,200 rent, I paid him $1,500, so he's getting an inflated payment. He let me have three months of no payments, and what I did is I took the sober living facility, they paid me $10,000 as their security deposit, which I was able to take, non-refundable, right, because they're gonna whatever, and then I rented it to them for $2,400 a month. Yeah. So I'm making $900 a month because they need a place to put their sober living tenants and they're being paid by the government. That's like almost guaranteed money. So $900 a month on that one house, there's two houses on the same property. So I'm making roughly, um, between the two, I'm making about 2,000 bucks a month. Yeah, and there's some downsides because you don't you don't get any upside in equity, but it's a zero down strategy, which zero is down. really cool. No and, money out, basically. And if you structure it right, you get paid today. Yeah. Like in your case, you got the ten thousand and cash flow every month in with fact, no money out of pocket. It might be like if you if you put Jerry on a park bench in the middle of Omaha, Nebraska, and you said, Jerry, go go make money today, like check in your pocket today, an arbitrage would be a really great way yeah. to do that. He could just call a rental and then he could find a sober living facility and go, Hey, if you pay me a five thousand dollar security deposit today, I'll hold your spot on this rental. You can make five thousand dollars today through an arbitrage situation. This master lease is a huge strategy in Puerto Rico because there's a real shortage in hospitality. So Airbnb is really popular. So what a lot of investors do is they'll do the master lease, then they'll just turn around and Airbnb it because the demand's so high and they'll double triple their money from what they're paying in their master lease. So Guys, phenomenal this strategy. is a really great like example of what you don't know is costing you a lot of money. Yeah, totally. Like you're spending money on leads, you're cold calling, you're doing all this kind of stuff. You'll get frustrated running into sellers that you can't solve their problem because you don't have these tools. Like it's powerful what we've talked about so far. Let's do now executory. Executory contract. So executory contract is a very top level description of it. It's the legal term of it. But depending on the state you're in, Arizona is called an agreement for sale. Michigan land contract. Michigan land contract. You've got Pennsylvania is bond for deed. Some are contract for deed. Contract for deed. There's actually 14 different names for an executory contract depending on which of the 50 states you're in, okay? Here's what it means. Um, when you are working with a seller, a seller will say, yeah, I'll... I'll sell or finance to you, or I'll let you take over my existing Chase payment, but I don't trust you to fail on the payments. I, you might fail on the payments. And so you can go, executory contract comes in handy when you say, well, no problem. Why don't you hold the deed or the ownership in escrow to protect me from ever for getting foreclosed on or having to be foreclosed on? So it protects the seller in that situation, gives the, sec the seller security. So if you have a seller that goes, I would sell to you on seller finance, but I'm not sure of you. You go, well, let's do a contract for deed. I want to retain title. Right. 
or hold it in escrow, right? Yeah. And then um, another way it helps you is when people are really afraid of the due on sale clause, which we'll talk about in future videos. When people are afraid of the due on sale clause, I offer that to them or their attorney or their, their real estate agent. I go, well, we could do a bond for deed or a contract for deed and agreement for sale. Remember, those are all the exact same thing. It just depends on the state you're in. We could do an executory contract and they go, oh, wow, that solves every problem in the book. Another one is uh, where executory contracts come in ha handy is I have a sub two deal. Instagram shut down my account for this. I did an IG live on it a couple days ago and I named my address, 6001 East. Um, it's a big no-no now. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, so I named the address. <laughs> We're not going to name it now. <laughs> We're not going to name it now. So I had an agent that had a listed property. Seller had bought the property last year with a VA loan, which means what? How much money did he put down? Zero with VA. Zero. Yeah, so the VA loans are zero down. So he, ha how much equity does he have, guys? He has no zero, equity. Zero. So when he goes to sell the property, guess what? Can't. Agent tells him, you're going to have to come out of pocket. And he goes, okay, well, figure it out. I, you're the agent, figure it out. So the agent actually reached out to us and said, I know you do all this creative stuff. Is there a way I can get paid my commissions? Which is a common question in creative finance. How does the agent get paid? In fact, don't even think about doing creative finance with agents unless you're going to be figuring out their commission because they're not going to be motivated to work your deal if they can't get paid. Right. And if you are reaching out to an agent, we'll talk to, to you guys about that in some future videos about how to reach out to them where these deals come from. But the common thing I say to an agent is, if I can get your commissions paid, would your seller be open to blah, 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 right? You want to get them paid. So this agent reaches out to us. We get under contract. We open escrow. We find out the seller has a down payment assistance program that helped pay for his furniture and his move-in costs on this loan. So the talk about zero down. Literally, he got paid, <laughs> this guy's got paid to buy. Talk about creative finance. <laughs> yeah. Dang man, be become a veteran. Holy crap! Yeah. So he gets all he gets payment, all this stuff paid for, but the terms of that down payment assistance program says that he can't sell the property for five years without a penalty. Mm. So he goes, well, the deal's done. I go, no, it's not. We're going to do an executory contract where I will own the property, but the deed or the ownership, which we'll talk about in the next video, hold did is, not transfer. Did not transfer. Inst yeah. Instead, it sits in a safety deposit Perfect box at example. Chase. Perfect example. Yeah. And that I won the deal. It, that deal will cash flow. It's an amazing opportunity for me. And nobody else could have solved that. The real estate agent got paid commissions. Um, they, the agent actually brought it to a wholesaler. Wholesaler brought it to me. So two people got paid on that transaction and I bought the deal using an executory contract that people don't even know about. Yeah. It's crazy. Awesome. So that's, I think, was that six or seven? Seven maybe? That, I forget what number we're on. Number, that's number six. We got one, maybe, one more. Okay. Maybe, and maybe we'll throw in a couple of really cool ones like the Morby method yeah, or Morby method. dating contract or one of those. Morby method, I would say number seven. So <laughs> let's say you have a seller that has a house paid off free and clear. Seller finance. And the seller says, I want a massive down payment. Okay, well, I'm brand new. I, I, yeah, I don't have 50 grand or whatever. I don't whatever. have 50 yeah. grand. What are you talking about? <laughs> so the Morby method is a strategy where you go to a bank or like there's companies like myinvestorloan.com. There's companies out there that will give you 50, 60% debt. And it's or could it be private money? Could it be private money. Yeah. Okay, it could be private money or a partner or whatever. You give the seller half of the money down, and then the seller gives you a seller finance for the other 50% down, right? So I've got a deal right now. It's in um, Lafayette, Louisiana, 105 unit multifamily deal, $11 million deal. What I did is seller says, I'll seller finance it to you, but I want 50% down. And I go, okay, no problem. So I went to my bank. They didn't look at me as the individual. They looked at the deal. And they gave me half of the money based on the deal. That half the money went to the seller. And then the seller let me have a second note in a, a note between the seller promissory note where I could make the seller payments that start in five years. So I'm literally, I just bought a 105 unit apartment complex with no money out of my pocket. Bank gave me 50%. The seller let me make payments on the other 50%. So it's, it's uh, seller financing the down payment mm -hmm. while leveraging some bank financing or other financing. That a lot of times doesn't require your credit at all. Very cool. Okay. I think those are, is there any others or are those the main ones we wanted to those cover? Those are the main ones. Okay. Yeah. Those are the main ones, guys. So 
Now watch for this series where we're gonna roll out individual videos that are gonna break down each of those strategies. Again, we're gonna go full circle in the technique. And, and very important part of this is that, remember, these Tyler's waving at us saying, this video's gone very long. YouTube, <laughs> YouTube hates long videos. Um, so make some comments down below. Make sure that the algorithm, you punch the algorithm right in the face with some comments and some likes because we wanna do a little bit longer video on some of these stuff. But here's what we didn't talk about on these strategies. These are how we acquire properties. Inside of these acquisition strategies we'll talk about, we'll talk about how you can make money through disposition or exiting the deal. So stay tuned to that. Because some people are going, what about wraps? You guys aren't talking about wraps. Well, guys, wraps are not an acquisition strategy. Wraps are a disposition strategy. So we'll talk about those in future videos. Great. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much, Pace. This is so fun. Isn't this great? This is going to be this is amazing. Best. Put yeah, me in this, this room for 25 hours. We could do it. We might actually stay in here for that long. Yeah, I know. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thanks for watching this. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and watch for those. We'll put, again, we'll put the playlist link in the description below. And if you really want to learn these strategies really, really well, I'm going to put Pace's information below as well. Be sure to get in his world. He's covering this stuff nonstop, day and night, so you can really learn it well. And we'll see you on the next video.